The year was 1984. Ronald Reagan was president, gas was $1 a gallon, and most importantly, it is the year the GSXR was born. Most of the time when we think GSXR, we think of fast, capable, super sport motorcycles that have insanely high top speeds and handle like a scalpel. But believe it or not, the very first motorcycle to feature the full GSXR name was a 400. Yes, a tiny carbureted fed 398cc 4 stroke inline 4 engine with 4 valves per cylinder and dual overhead cams, making a whopping 59 horsepower and 28.9 foot pound of torque. And it was designed to compete against the Honda CBR400 and the Yamaha FZ400R. The GSXR400 was 29 pounds lighter than the CBR400 RR while making the same power, and the GSXR was 69 pounds lighter than the FZ400R while again making the same power. Because of the massive difference in weight, the GSXR was able to outperform both the Honda and Yamaha, and the GSXR didn't just beat up on other brands, but also on other Suzukis. The new GSXR400 had even a better power to weight ratio than the RG250 Gamma, which was a two stroke. The GSXR400 was the start of a new era. Suzuki had just created the fastest and best handling 400cc bike ever made, and they were just getting started. Nineteen eighty five might have been considered the most important year in all of Suzuki history because in nineteen eighty five one of the most iconic supersport motorcycles was brought to life, and that bike was the GSXR seven fifty. Suzuki's philosophy with the GSXR seven fifty was to create a production motorcycle that offered race bred technology and performance at an affordable price. And thanks to that philosophy, Suzuki continues to show just how amazing the GSXR 750 is and how it has stood the test of time. Because even in the year 2019, the GSXR 750 is the only Japanese 750cc inline 4 super sport bike still being produced and sold. This new GSXR 750 was one of the world's first sport bikes to use an aluminum frame over the traditional steel frame. The GSXR 750 had a dry weight of just 388 pounds, which is far lighter than most other sport bikes of that similar displacement during that time. And thanks to the 749cc dual overhead cam, 16 valve engine, the bike produced 100 horsepower at 10,500 rpm and 53 foot pound of torque at 10,000 rpm. This GSXR also featured one of the first mainstream oil cooling systems which helped allow this bike to rev as high as it does and produce as much power as it does. Also in 1985, Suzuki decided to add a fuel gauge for their GSXR 400. And in 1986, Suzuki revisited their 400 and made big changes by improving the power and the cooling system of the design. And they also changed over the dual circle headlights to a square headlight. And the 400 wasn't the only bike to get updated. The 750 had received some updates as well, such as a 25mm longer swing arm to improve the handling and a modified belly pan and an upgraded headlamps. And most importantly, the 1986 model was the first year the 750 was introduced into the US market. And just one year after the release of the GSXR 750, a big brother was added. An 1100cc engine was born, known as the GSXR 1100. This brand new 1100 had a steel box frame, full fairing, full floater rear swing arm, and four cylinder four stroke engine. This massive engine produced 125 horsepower at 9500 RPM and 76 foot-pounds of torque at 8000 RPM. And this bike had a 434 pound dry weight. Compared to modern sport bikes, this 1100 was very unimpressive, but in 1986 this bike was incredible and was praised for having great power and handling and being relatively light for what it was. Nineteen eighty seven brought to us the birth of even more GSXRs, and the first is the GSXR fifty. Yes, a tiny little forty nine CC single cylinder pocket bike. This bike was mostly known to us as the RB fifty GAG, however it was also called the GSXR fifty. This bike was mainly considered a toy, but I felt I had to add it in because it was such a cool little bike that Suzuki threw in there that featured the GSXR name. A 49cc bike based off of their racing line is incredibly unique and cool, and it did make about 5 horsepower and weighed 190 pounds. I bet you it was a ton of fun to play on, even as an adult. 
1987 also brought to us another model though, and that was the GSX-R250. The 250 was mostly based off of its bigger 750cc brother. Although the GSX-R250 did have a steel box frame, now unlike 250s and 300s you see today, this GSX-R250 was special. Special because it had a 4 cylinder engine opposed to the 1 and 2 cylinder engines you see today in small displacement bikes. These 250 inline 4s could rev incredibly high thanks to their tiny pistons. This 250 could rev to 20,000 RPMs, and while riding it at that RPM, it sounded simply amazing, like a little Formula 1 car. As for the 400, Suzuki quickly decided to correct their mistake and brought back the twin headlights, along with new wheels, new exhaust design, gold brake calipers, and new paint scheme. Also, the 750 was upgraded with 41mm front forks with NEAS, a new electronically activated suspension, and a steering damper was fitted as standard. The fuel tank capacity was also increased to 21 liters. And the 1100 was the only bike to not get any updates for the 1987 model year. Nineteen eighty eight saw the death of the GSXR fifty, just a single year after it was introduced. The GSXR two fifty still got to live on, although no significant changes were added. However, it is worth noting that Suzuki did change the name to GSXR two fifty RSP to help fall in line with their Super Sport models. Interestingly enough, this baby GSXR only seems to feature slightly tweaked bodywork, which reminds me a lot of the BMW S1000 RR. It has the same shark fin design and it has the little circle headlight. The GSXR 400 was also upgraded as well, as a new aluminum frame was implemented along with new fairings and a smaller wheelbase. The 400 also got slingshot carburetors, polished stainless steel silencers, curved radiator, Tokiko four-cylinder front brake calipers, and a rear hugger mudguard. A new 4-2 exhaust was designed to help create more mid-range torque, although peak horsepower wasn't affected by much. And the GSX-R 750 saw its first major update, which featured a new chassis design, engine, and bodywork revisions. Introduction of a new short stroke version of the oil cooled engine which had a 73mm bore and a 44.7mm stroke and could achieve higher RPM limit of 13,500 RPM. Internal engine dimensions changed to accommodate the new bore and stroke. This engine used larger valves and larger carburetors than previous years. The Makuni model BST 36SS slingshot carbs were 36mm in diameter and featured vacuum operated slides. The slide action section resembled the shape of a slingshot, hence the name. A four spring clutch was used on the short stroke motor, new styling and twin black silencers were added, wheels are now 17 inch three spoke design and used a 160 tire in the rear and a 120 tire in the front. Slingshot graphics first appeared on the bodywork, forks now used a cartridge design system which were 43mm in diameter. The second generation model was heavier than the first but had a stiffer frame and more power. And the 1100 featured no changes for the 1988 model year. And in 1989, Suzuki updated their 250 once again. This time, they added a welded aluminum twin tube frame, an 18 inch rear wheel, and larger front brakes. And the SP version had fully adjustable suspension. Suzuki decided to rename their GSXR 400 to the GSXR 400R. No other changes were made. And the 750 got a few minor cosmetic changes, and ground clearance was improved. However, Suzuki did release a limited edition racing homologation model known to us as the GSXR 750R, which had a different stroke, upgraded crankcase, crankshaft connecting rods, and a new clutch. Also, 40mm slingshot carbs and a 4 to 1 exhaust pipe, close ratio gearbox, a braced rear swing arm, and a 19 liter aluminum fuel tank were added as well. Only 150 units were sold in the United States. They also released a GSXR 750RK, otherwise known as the GSXR 750RR, which was a limited production model with only 500 units being made. The 1100 again had no changes for the third year in a row. The 90s brought to us great sadness as 1990 was officially the last model year for the GSXR 250 in which no changes were made. However, the 400 was completely updated with inverted forks, new double cradle aluminum frame, and a 4 into 1 exhaust. Thanks to the new exhaust, power was increased to 60 horsepower. 
As for the GSX-R750, although this model looks very similar to the previous year, many changes were made. Suzuki made updates to the engine, suspension, bodywork, brakes, and chassis. This was the first GSX-R to be fitted with inverted forks as standard. It now featured new valves and larger carburetors. The new Makuni carburetors were 38mm in diameter and featured an additional power jet high-speed circuit, which was used to fine-tune fuel mixture from 10,000 RPMs all the way up to the rev limiter. The exhaust system was also changed. Gone were the dual silencers and replaced with one stainless steel silencer on the right side. The transmission output shaft was lengthened to accommodate a wider wheel, a new curved oil cooler design and oil lines were installed, and the bodywork was tweaked slightly. Finally, the GSX-R1100 got its first update. Upgraded suspension, tires, and swing arm were implemented for the 1990 model year. The inverted Showa front forks together with the new 130 front tire gave the bike better stability in the front fork and better handling. Even the rear shock was new and a wider 180 rear tire was fitted. The swing arm was made longer giving the bike a slightly longer wheelbase resulting in better high speed stability. And in 1991 the 250 was officially gone from the lineup and the 400 featured no new changes. However, the 750 did get some changes. Although not all welcomed, this was the GSX-R 750M model, and it gained 33 pounds over the previous model. Funny enough, most Suzuki brochures didn't even mention the overall weight of the bike as they knew that would turn off some potential buyers. The most notable feature of the new GSX-R 750M are the fared-in headlamps and a slanted nose, both of which were designed to reduce drag. Also fitted was a new larger seat and new rear bodywork that featured twin tail lamps. This was the last GSX-R to have an oil-cooled engine. The internal changes included a new valve train that required valve clearances to be adjusted with shims. The 1100 featured no changes. For 1992, once again the 400 remained unchanged, although there's a really good reason for that, as 1992 marks the birth of the very first GSX-R 600. The first model had the same body specifications as the 1992 GSX-R 750, with just a smaller 599cc engine that made about 106 horsepower and 48 foot-pound of torque. The curb weight was just about 485 pounds. Suzuki also added in some changes for their 750. The new 750 featured a new water-cooled engine and revised frame bodywork and suspension. The 750 and 600 both featured inverted forks and the 750 made 118 horsepower and 59 foot-pound of torque. The curb weight was 516 pounds for the 750. And once more, the 1100 received no changes. Nineteen ninety three was another sad year for Suzuki, as the GSXR four hundred saw a reduction of horsepower from sixty all the way down to fifty three thanks to a power restriction in Japan. Both the 600 and 1100 saw no changes for the 1993 model year, however the 750 saw some decent changes, most cosmetic changes, however there was a major revision of engine internals. The crank and connecting rods were forged steel instead of cast iron. The valve train was also revived as well which allowed for a slight bump in power. Nineteen ninety four might have been one of the worst years for Suzuki, as the four hundred and eleven hundred had no changes and the six hundred was actually discontinued for undocumented reasons, at least that I could find out on the internet. The 750, however, got a reduction in power and weight over last year's model. The inverted forks and swing arms were both slightly changed as well. So two bikes saw no changes, one bike was completely discontinued, another one lost power. Again in 1995, the 600 was still absent from the lineup, and the 400 and 1100 continue to feature no changes. The 750 once more gets all the love from Suzuki, with the release of the new SPR limited edition racing homologation model, which has special factory parts including wide-mouthed TRM40 carburetors, closed ratio gearbox, magnesium engine covers, alloy water pump, six piston brake calipers, and a new balanced swing arm. The SPR was 22 pounds lighter than the previous model. I'm starting to think that the 90s were just not Suzuki's era, as 1996 was again another sad year for Suzuki. 
The 600 is still absent from the lineup, and this was officially the 400's last production model year, and the 1100 featured no changes yet again. The GSX-R750 introduced a new twin spar frame derived completely from Suzuki's RGV 500GP racing bike. A new compact and lightweight engine incorporated magnesium covers on the cylinder head to aid in weight reduction. These changes saw a decrease in weight by almost 40 pounds. While power had increased to 128 horsepower, this year's model finally addressed the weight problems that had plagued the GSX-R throughout the first half of the 90s. Other features include electronically controlled main jet block off under D-cell system for emission purposes, 39mm Makuni carburetors and inverted forks which were fully adjustable, also a 17 inch rear rim was fitted as standard and a new updated 180 rear size tire as well. Nineteen ninety seven saw the resurgence of the six hundred, which was now newly redesigned with the introduction of the Suzuki Ram Air Direct System, otherwise known as SRAD. The seven fifty and eleven hundred saw no noteworthy changes for the nineteen ninety seven model year. For 1998, the 600 was unchanged and the 750 featured Suzuki's first electronic fuel injection system which increased power all the way up to 134 brake horsepower, and the 1100 once again featured no changes, and 1998 was the last model year for the 1100. As mentioned before, Suzuki killed off the 1100 in 1999. The 600 and 750 saw no changes as well. And now we are at the turn of the century, the year 2000, in which Suzuki decided to once more do absolutely nothing to their 600, and instead gave all of their love to the 750. So the GSX-R750 all-new model has been released, lighter, stronger, faster, sometimes referred to as the Superman bike because of the headlight shape. The engine was upgraded and produced even more power and was smaller thanks to its narrower cylinder head. These changes allowed for Suzuki to make the airbox larger and make the intake tracks less restrictive, which means more air got to the engine thus producing more power. But the main focus was on the fueling, as the new EFI system was improved to allow for more corrections and fueling adjustments. The 750 also got a new set of bodywork that made it more aerodynamic, and a new instrument cluster was added as well. The new twin spar frame, longer swing arm, and lighter braking components and wheels helped reduce the weight even further and this new 750 weighed just 366 pounds dry. Suzuki starts out 2001 by redesigning their 600. This new 600 was lighter, more agile, and more powerful than the previous generation. It also saved Suzuki from becoming a laughing stock as the other 600s were far ahead of the GSX-R before this upgrade. And with this new GSX-R 600 making around 115 brake horsepower and weighing just 359 pounds dry, Suzuki was now the ones laughing. The 750 remained mostly unchanged, however Suzuki did fix an issue with the transmission was having that caused second gear to slip and eventually transmission failure. And with the death of Suzuki's 1100 back in 1999, Suzuki knew they just had to replace that bike. And so they revealed their all new model for 2001, the Suzuki GSX-R 1000. The new GSX-R 1000 had a 988cc inline-4 engine that produced 160 brake horsepower and all at a dry weight of just 374 pounds. The GSX-R 1000 is lighter, more powerful, and more balanced than any other street legal supersport bike at that time. The new GSX-R 1000 was voted as the best international bike of the year in 2001 by 13 bike magazines from all over the world. It's safe to say that Suzuki developed a nice addition to their lineup. With such a splash from 2001, how could 2002 compare? Well, it's clear that Suzuki needed a break because the 600, 1000, and 750 saw no changes for the 2002 model year. In 2003, the 600 and 750 had no updates as Suzuki decided to set their sights onto their relatively new 1000. 
And just when you thought the GSX-R1000 couldn't have been better, Suzuki updated it with more power, better handling, and lighter weight. The physical dimensions are pretty much the same as the previous model, but lots of the internal parts were changed and upgraded. The engine remains the same 988cc inline 4, but more power and torque and better throttle response were added thanks to many small tweaks. The frame was updated with ribs and the brakes were upgraded to 6 piston calipers which weighed less but also worked better. The headlights were mounted vertically to allow ram air intakes in front to be placed closer to the center which allowed more direct air. The entire exhaust system is now entirely made of titanium to save additional weight, and the tail light is replaced with LED light to give it more of a high-tech modern look. The year 2004 brought some love to the 600 as a total redesign was done by Suzuki, which changed the fairings, fuel tank, and added inverted forks and radial mounted brakes. Titanium valves were also added and a new ECU was added as well. These updates reduced the dry weight to 355 pounds and increased the horsepower to 124 brake horsepower. The new 750 also received some upgrades very similar to the 600, with the addition of titanium valves and an upgraded ECU. New bodywork was also added along with some other small tweaks. These upgrades allowed the engine to produce 147 horsepower. The dry weight of the new 750 was all the way down to 359 pounds as well. And the 1000 received no updates. In 2005, Suzuki made no noteworthy changes to their 600 or 750. However, they did make big changes to their 1000, which they refer to as the K5. This new K5 1000 had a newly redesigned engine and chassis. The engine was 11 cc's larger, which brought it up to 998.6 cc's. This new engine also produced an impressive 170 horsepower. It also had a totally new, lighter and more rigid frame. New brakes were also added and a new titanium silencer was also added as well. And in 2006, Suzuki introduced the all-new GSX-R600, which featured an underslung exhaust and slipper clutch. The engine was also completely redesigned even though it made the same power as the previous model. The fuel injection was also reworked and improved, and an all-new aluminum alloy frame was added. The 750 was also redesigned as well with a new frame motor and swing arm. The stroke was increased and the transmission is now stacked, and the rotors also went from 300mm to 310mm. The 1000 received no changes. And keeping with tradition, Suzuki opted to not update their 600 and 750 for the 2007 model year. Instead, they decided to update their GSX-R 1000, otherwise known as the K7, which received a significant update for the 2007 model year. The new model did gain 14 pounds over the previous model, but that was part of the new emissions regulations that were forced upon Suzuki to redesign the exhaust system. Suzuki was able to counter this by improving the aerodynamics of the GSX-R1000, and Suzuki also added the first of its kind, selectable rider modes. This featured three different engine mapping configurations, which were accessible with a switch on the handlebar. The three modes were standard, sport, and wet. The 2008 rolled around and revealed by far the best looking GSX-R 600 and 750 ever made. The new bodywork is still to this day my favorite GSX-R of any model size. Both models also received a new subframe, fuel tank, and the introduction of the new Suzuki Drive Mode Selector, which was basically rider modes to reduce the power. Although a little different from the 1000, it is basically the same exact thing. And as you might have guessed, the 1000 received no changes for 2008. Two thousand and nine, no changes for the six hundred or seven fifty. However, big changes for the GSX R one thousand. The engine was updated to reduce size and weight. As a result, the wheelbase was shortened and the swing arm was lengthened to improve suspension. Showa big piston forks were added to the front, and the engine's capacity was updated to an even nine hundred and ninety nine cc's. And along with many other small engine changes, which to get to the point resulted in one hundred eighty two horsepower and eighty one foot pounds of torque. The brakes were also updated and they added in a four-stage LED shift light system while keeping its gear indicator and lap timer.
Well, this one is easy. In 2010, Suzuki updated not a single one of their GSX-Rs. And not so easy is 2011, where the 600 received some big updates. The first major news is that the 600 is now 19 pounds lighter overall, and new Showa Big Piston forks, Brembo monoblock radial front calipers, and a redesigned lightened frame and swing arm were added, which also helped to result in a shorter wheelbase. A new gauge cluster inspired by the GSX-R1000 was added, Power was overall the same, but mid-range torque was improved thanks to new cams, pistons, and a higher compression ratio. Also, Suzuki tilted the engine slightly on both the 600 and 750 to keep weight down low. Also, Suzuki updated the fuel injectors, which were used to give more mid-range power while maintaining the same top-end power. Unfortunately, the new bodywork doesn't look as nice as the previous model, but it still looks good and new Brembo brakes in the front and a new back torque limiting clutch was added which allows for smoother downshifting and Showa big piston forks became standard along with the Showa rear shock and an upgraded instrument cluster was also added and the bike weighed 20 pounds lighter and the engine makes the same power as the previous model and of course there were no changes for the 2011 GSX-R1000 And now we're on the year 2012 and you guys should probably get used to this as the 600 and 750 are unchanged. The 1000 did see some revisions and a long awaited revision at that as it hasn't been updated since 2009. Suzuki enhanced the chassis suspension and braking system and reduced the overall weight of their 1000. The brakes stopped quicker, the engine has more mid-range power, and the handling became lighter. And also the GSX-R1000 became one of the first bikes to have big piston show of front forks. Horsepower is still at 182, but torque was increased from 82 foot-pounds to 86 foot-pounds. Suzuki kept things quiet in 2013, as there were no updates or changes for any of the GSX-R models. In 2014, Suzuki made no changes again for their 600 or 750. The 1000 did get a 50th anniversary special edition which featured a new color scheme and special anodized parts, but otherwise remained unchanged. And in 2015, no GSX-R had any updates. In 2016, the 600 and 750 were not updated as well. However, Suzuki did release three variations of the GSX-R1000. There's now the standard version, then the ABS version, and then a commemorative model which had a special paint scheme. And in 2017, we finally get some excitement, only in a very small way, and I mean very small, as Suzuki revealed the all-new GSX-R125. Armed with a fearsome 15 horsepower engine, this new GSX-R looks like a GSX-R though. From a distance, with your eyes squinted. Oh, and they did release a new GSX-R150 as well, although it's pretty much the exact same bike and makes very similar power. Suzuki also made no changes to their 600 or 750 yet again, and the 1000 finally got a huge new update, along with technically a new R model has been revealed, which has a few more bells and whistles over the standard. I actually did make a whole video on just this bike going over every little change and there's a link in the description if you're interested, but basically this new 1000 makes 200 horsepower and a ton of power all throughout the rev range. Along with that, new bodywork and design and of course the introduction of a full system of electronics and rider aids such as traction control were added. This new GSX-R1000 had so many updates and changes that it really does deserve its own video and that's why I made one. So don't be shy and go check it out in the description. With Suzuki now having five GSX-R models on the showroom floors, you figured at least one of them would have an update for 2018. And well, you would be wrong, because Suzuki made no changes to a single GSX-R in their lineup for the 2018 model year. And in 2019, we saw no changes again to the 125, 150, 600, and 750, 
but we did see some new changes with the GSX-R1000. One of these changes was Suzuki finally made their bi-directional quick shifter standard. Along with that, the suspension was tweaked and new Showa balance free forks were added, as well as some braided steel lines for the R model and some other minor changes. And that's all it for the 2019 model year. Suzuki's philosophy that started with the GSX-R750 all the way back in 1985 was to produce a production motorcycle that offered race spread technology and performance at an affordable price. And this is a philosophy that they still uphold today. Just look at the GSX-R600, 750, and 1000. They are all packed with powerful technology and are the cheapest to be offered out of the Japanese competition. Suzuki loves motorcycles and wants people to ride, and they want riders riding their bikes. GSX-R might get a bad name sometimes thanks to some of the people on the internet with memes and whatnot, and with some of the more questionable riders due to their bikes. But I think it's safe to say that the GSX-R is something much more special than that and deserves to be given a second look. Also before we sign out here I just want to approach a few questions I know I'm going to get, most notably the Suzuki Hayabusa. Well I decided to be very consistent on which models I chose to have in this video. I only picked models that were GSX-R, because a lot of models in Suzuki's lineup features the name GSX but not with the GSX-R. I know that the Hayabusa is technically a GSX-1300R, but because the R had to be immediately after the GSX, it wasn't added. See, the GSX-R is their Super Sport racing line, not their Hayabusa. Hayabusa is more of a hyper sport, it's not really a racing bike. Which, by the way, I did make a whole video dedicated just on the Hayabusa, so if you're mad at me for not including it in this video, then you will find it in the description. Also, I did not include their new 250 because, again, it's not a GSX-R, it's just the GSX. And interestingly enough, Suzuki did name their 125 and 150 as a GSX-R, although I'm not sure why they did that. They're not really racing, and then they didn't do it with the 250. I don't know. I just wanted to be consistent, so I included them in, even though I probably should not have. And yes, the little GSX-R50, I just know somebody's going to be so mad in the comments that I included it. But it is a GSX-R and it does feature the name GSX-R, it's right in the title, and it is insanely cool. I mean, it was a good breakup from just the regular models of Super Sports and stuff. And you just see this little toy, by, it's just really cool and I, I was glad to include it, I'm happy I included it and I don't regret it. Anyway guys, that is it. This is the 100,000 subscriber special video. This is my thanks to all of you. Immediately after hitting 100,000 subscribers, I was overcame by joy and I wanted to thank all of you. So I did post on my discussion section of my YouTube channel a poll about what video you wanted me to make and you guys wanted a full history of the GSXR, so that is what I gave you. So anyway, this is the video from me to you guys as a thanks. Thank you so much for all that you guys do. Thank you a million times over. I appreciate each and every single one of you, especially you guys that are hearing me right now that actually make it to the end of these videos. It means the world to me. Thank you so much. I hope you all have a great day. Take care and bye-bye.